welcome to Global from Asia, episode 271. And uh, our intro is in Chiang Mai International Airport. On the road again. Welcome to the Global from Asia podcast, where the daunting process of running an international business is broken down into straight up actionable advice. And now, your host, Michael Michelini. All right. As always, I try to do little intros on the road, in buses, in airports. I don't know if I've done it on the airplane itself, but we are global from Asia after all, and get some little background noise of the life on the road. So I'm in Chiang Mai now and going to Hong Kong. I feel like uh, preparing for a war zone or something. <laughs> Seriously, a little bit scared. We're doing a little dinner meetup with some members and VIPs while I'm there, and of course banking and. People are like, don't wear a black shirt and uh, don't wear a bandana or uh, it's sad, honestly. I mean, Hong Kong, this show started around Hong Kong business and uh, it is tragic, the uh, chaos that is happening there. But uh, I'm still flying in, stay there a little while, Shenzhen, Guangzhou for the cross-border summit preparations and then Zhengzhou, Henan. I will be uh, speaking on a panel about the trade war. I'm going to be speaking about the trade war in China at Chinese conferences. I'm like the, the token white guy on a panel talking about the trade war. And I guess I'll be the enemy <laughs> or something. Maybe I'll get some eggs thrown at me on the stage. Uh, I feel like it's kind of my duty. And uh, one of them is a government, one's a private event. And they're like, hey, you're an American, you're, you're a foreigner. Uh, are you brave enough to come into this? So. I'm going in. I'm going to go in and speak and share. I'm trying to keep it real like I try on this show and even in today's episode. Hopefully I don't disappear or get an exit ban and get stuck in China for a while. And Like John Graham was on the show a few months ago. and I feel like it's my job. Some people say, are you a reporter? I have a, you know, I have a vlog camera and other things as I'm going around, but... We'll maybe save some of this for the blah, blah, blah session about that after, after the interview. Today's interview is a good one. John's, he's the new host of China Business Cast. Him and I did a deal with Shlomo earlier this year, and he became the new host of the China Business Cast podcast, which some of you might have listened to. I was host there for quite a few years. It's gone through a few different hosts, and which is awesome. And uh, besides him being uh, the host of China Business Cast, he's also an expert on Chinese hosting and servers. He has, he has consulting and uh, data companies he's done in Europe and in China. And he's a very experienced tech person, business person. Um, we've worked together also at uh, the client work I do with Unipro in Hong Kong. And so he has amazing insights. And him and I have a conversation about, you know, how do I not get my website blocked in China? How do I host in China? It's a common question. It's a valuable question. And we're, we're like not holding back. We're talking about licenses and procedures and strategies that I think is pretty valuable. And I hope you appreciate that too on the show. So uh, without further ado, let's jump into this week's episode 271. Globalformasia.com slash episode 271. So as I said, I will be heading into Guangzhou, preparing and planning for the cross-border summit. We will work really hard. This will be our fourth annual one here at Global From Asia. We have amazing partners and sponsors and attendees and speakers and, and all of that. If you enjoy uh, the show and you want to support and you want to connect with these amazing people, it's quite a challenge, honestly, like visa invitation letters and uh, all the coordinating of these 20 plus speakers, two days plus uh, also masterminds, VIPs. Thank you to those that purchased the tickets. If you are interested and want to check everything out, it's uh, really appreciated to uh, support us and see you there. I will be there about a month from today. It's getting up quick. October 22nd, 23rd, 2019, Guangzhou, China, 4th Annual Cross Border Summit.com. If you can't make it, maybe share it with a friend that could. Much obliged. Much appreciated. Okay, thank you everybody for tuning in to a Global From Asia podcast. This is, I'm really uh, excited and happy to get our guest on today. He's our host of China Business Cast, John Slummer. Thanks for being here, John. 
Yeah, it's great to be here, uh, Mike. It's been a while since we've uh, been in touch, but uh, things have been good. Yeah, it's really awesome. I'm really happy to we're chatting about the China Business Cast show, which is awesome that you're, you're, you're growing it and there's more hosts coming on. And in addition to being the host of the China Business Cast, you're also the founder of Red Star Consulting, which we'll talk about today, which is helping getting companies, I'd say, online hosted in China, is if that's correct. Yeah, that, that is one of the things we do. We we do more things, and we're actually soon rebranding and and adding more services and solutions to uh, to our offerings. But that's basically the core how we started. I, I started helping businesses, international businesses, get online on the Chinese internet, which is uh, somewhat of a challenge at times. It's totally. I, yeah, I mean, uh, it's an important one. I think people always ask and. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to have you here to fill that gap uh, on today's show. I think we chatted about this a little bit before the show, before recording, but you know the the common question at least I hear is how do I make sure my site doesn't get blocked in China? Right, like that's I think the first mm-hmm. thing people ask, and I think that usually means they don't exactly know the scenario. But I think is that one you get asked probably quite often too. Um. Not too much how to, yeah, we, we go over it with our clients. So uh, the customers that we help, basically, um, they already, uh, they want to do a market entry into China digitally. And then I see two paths, basically, uh, or you can very early on, um, as like an experimental, see if there's a market fit. Uh, use Hong Kong as a proximity close to, to mainland China um, and host your website there. Or if you're already uh, sure of their market, go into uh, into the Chinese market full and then go through all the Chinese processes that you need to do to become fully legal on the Chinese internet. Exactly. Uh, other common ones we chatted about before is, of course, trying to not put in like Western social media widgets or plugins or fonts as well is another, another uh, good tip, I'd say. And yeah, so so at the beginning of, of projects that we do, we do like an audit on on what there is, what the website already currently has. And the website is usually built with a Western mindset. So it has like YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, etc. And these widgets, they just there are these services are blocked in China. So that's that's a no go. So for, for your China website, China facing website, you really need to basically build a copy of your, of your existing website and really tailor it to, um, to China. And what you just mentioned are like the social media networks, but from a technical standpoint, you have to do a few things differently. Um, actually you don't have to do too much to make your site pretty, um, like well suited for the Chinese markets. Um, but there's a few things that you need to do um, to to make that uh, a better match. Yeah, we'll we'll go through that a little bit today. And I think, uh, yeah, I think it's probably the best long term is just having two separate websites. I think, right, your Chinese website, which almost is different content, almost. I mean, depending on what kind of business or web stuff you're talking about. But I think. Um, I think like, you know, WeChat has two, I don't want to, I'm not so technical as you, but two, I call it servers or databases almost for their users, right? I think, um, and so I think it's more complicated. They, they, used to have, they used to have in the past to just to quickly add before oh, we move. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, they, they used to have like two, like an international version and then the Chinese version, but at, over the uh, last one and a half, two years, I'd say, that has like fully consolidated into uh-huh. one, one thing. So if you have a WeChat account uh, or if a WeChat official account, that's what I think you're, you're mentioning uh, at, they're now fully uh, accessible for everyone on the WeChat ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, so it's kind of funny how the Chinese, example, of course, Tencent or WeChat is a Chinese software that, uh, or system and they actually have to have like an overseas system if they, well, when I think they retreated really, I think the whole chat wars has taken a little bit of a, I think people have just decided, you know, the winners are the winners where they are, you know, we, we chat, WhatsApp, you know, align a little bit, uh, um, 
Facebook Messenger. So I think when the wars ended and WeChat basically just decided to focus mostly in China, but before, when they were really trying to go global, they set up uh, almost two systems, like two, you know, so especially the official accounts, which is kind of like a Chinese website or a Chinese Facebook page. Um, you had to get one inside China or one outside China, depending. Exactly. Of course, most people are targeting Chinese. I think I told this, Johns, but uh, a friend that does a tech startup in China, uh, US got really mad uh, because he spent a lot of time verifying and opening a WeChat official account. And then he realized it was on the international, it was a US based one, which didn't reach the Chinese uh, community, let's say, or users. And he says, what's the point if I can't reach the Chinese users? But uh, it, it was a very confusing situation. And therefore, it's, I think it's a great thing that they have resolved that issue or just consolidated into one global platform. And of course, the, the majority of the users, uh, like 90 whatever percent is, is fully China in mainland China. The other part is Chinese people outside of China. <laughs> and there's like a tiny part that's like international uh, audience that, that is also using WeChat. But comparatively, that is that's really small. Or foreigners like us with uh, yeah. Ch- Chinese uh, <laughs> family or relations or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, Exactly. Like, so, yeah. So basically, I going back to the point, I think it's still safer to have maybe a Chinese language. Of course, there's a whole question of TLD, like .cn, .com, Pinyin. I don't know. But I think some people try to have it on the same website, you know, like slash CN or slash ZH, but I usually would suggest having a completely separate like IP or location or even even content um, for their child. I I agree with that. So... Uh, what I advise customers, they, let's say company.com, that's their website. And then if they want to have a Chinese facing company uh, website, then I would recommend them company.cn or company.com.cn to register that in some kind of variation, uh, depending on the availability of the, the top level domain. Okay. Um, and, and then based with that, if it's a Chinese facing website, you, you need content in China, in Chinese. Um, so your original English content, see if you can get it translated or, or localized. Localized is better than just pure translation. I see some customers coming to us with like, they use Google Translate and then the Chinese doesn't really make much sense because yeah. the translation service is like, yeah, it's great. You get a, a little bit of an understanding of what the translation should be, but it's not proper, properly translated or properly localized. Um, so yeah, I would go with a, with a Chinese facing um, domain name. So .cn and .com and then you need Chinese content. And then the choice is up to you where you are in your business phase on where you want to host um, your website. Um, in Hong Kong, I see that as the first um, level of options or fully go into China um, and host a website in China, but that needs a, a lot more requirements and rules. Um, and complexity, which we can talk about uh, in a bit as well. Yeah, I think I think they get to the next step, but I kind of maybe obviously this could be a touchy subject, but of course we should face it. Uh, why websites might get blocked? I, I could, I don't know. I get a little bit more risky lately on some of the content here. I, it's up to you how you, you know. I don't want to pull you into it, but obviously if somebody says anti Chinese uh, government type of things that goes against the policies or that's the whole reason by you hosting in China or, you know, wanting to not get blocked in China is you're not going to do something that say something that the government doesn't want you to say. I mean, right. I well, mean, it's, it's, From my perspective, it's real easy. If you want to do business in China, you got to follow the business environment and, um, business environment here is controlled by by the Chinese government and they have a self-censoring policy and certain things they don't want you to talk about. Yeah. If you have issues, if you have issues with that, then don't do business in China. Um, in, and of course I'm, I'm not happy with everything that happens here, but I, I, for me, for myself, morality, uh, I'm flexible enough to, to move her in between. If, if your morality does not allow that, then you should not do business in China. Yeah, I didn't put this on my agenda, and we could uh, we could skip it or whatever in editing. Oh, but 
But uh, the whole Google story, I, I liked it. I talked to some of my personal blog back when it happened. I was in China 2009 to 2010 timeframe, if I remember correctly. And uh, there's probably never going to be the exact story, but there was something that made Google decide that they were going to stop filtering their results and like complying with the local requirements or laws that they needed to do. And then they thought they just kind of thought that they could get the Chinese government to allow them to do that, or they didn't care if they didn't get to do that. And then they, you know, it was google.cn and uh, they got, they didn't win that (laughs) and they lost. uh, I think they left mostly left China and their site got blocked. And then they went to google.com.hk in 2010. I think that's where they still are, but uh, that's, I think blocked in China. And then, Past that, Google, everything Google got blocked before that. I think 2009 or so, Google stuff mostly worked. I think maybe YouTube didn't. But, uh, you know, I, I remember that uh, I remember that news articles reading and I just, I don't know. I think if Google loses, you know, everybody could lose. You know, they're just, they're just not negotiable. And like you said, uh, if you're not, whatever reason, not willing or able or interested to do that, you're, you know, you just... Uh, no. Get out, and 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 that's what they did. They they chose to basically leave China. They they left some research and development and R and D centers um, intact, and they still have them from from my knowledge. Um, so Google is still like physically present in China, just not as a as a web searching engine, not as a as a YouTube channel. Um, but some of their Google businesses are still still here. Um, but yeah, they decided basically to 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 leave China, and this year and last year they were working on that new Chinese search engine that was in the news a lot as well, and oh. it resolves around the same question: like uh, they wanted to put a new search engine in that like filtered and complied through local regulations, but there was a lot of backlash from like U.S. government and then other policymakers um, around the world for that. Um, so it it is a difficult situation, and it really depends on. Um, if you're willing to do business here or not. Yeah, I know. I guess we'll just let the listener decide their own internal policy. But I mean, I guess the complaint that I would say against Google is they agreed to do it and they complied and then they decided to not comply. So, I mean, my my argument to to, to them would be if you're not going to agree to the, you know, whether you like it or not, you can't really change later. I mean, I guess is what I would say. Um, well, their, their policy is like do no evil or something, right? But <laughs> yeah. Like every mega corporation, even if your policy is do no evil, you're, you're still somewhat flexible. And, and uh, I'm sure they don't mean do evil, but you still got to <laughs> earn money and, and money, money talks. Yeah. So, you know, we can talk. I know ICP license is a hot topic and uh, that's the you were saying earlier about the more complex or what's the steps. I think that's kind of like the main step to getting a uh, legal in China with your website or web business. Yeah. So let's say that uh, you want to, you've explored the market, you maybe had a website in Hong Kong for a year or a bit, and you really want to move into um, hosting your website in, into China. Um, then there's a few things that you need uh, that um, cost time and cost money. Um, one of the things for your website is called an ICP license. Um, or they're, they're, And there's different versions of it. And that is, uh, especially since this year, since like Chinese New Year, Spring Festival, uh, getting way more complicated and more expensive actually again. Because mm-hmm. um, they, they introduce more rules and more licenses. Um, but to, to even start considering that, you need, um, there's two options. Um, you need to start a Chinese uh, business because these licenses can only be acquired by Chinese business entities. So as a foreign business, you can start uh, what's called a WUFI or your wholly foreign-owned entity. So it's a, a basically a Chinese subsidiary of your foreign business that you completely own. And with that, you can um, apply for, for some of these licenses. Some of them are still off limits or um, they're technically not off limits, but they're so expensive that it's basically off limit. Hmm. Um, but, that, but that's basically where you have to start. Um, 
this whole subject area is is quite complex and and ever changing literally every month there is new rules and and updates so in short you need a you need a partner to help you figure this out so we have clients that are are quite large uh, even a few uh, that are on the stock exchanges around the world and they have a few hundred people in china working for them but they still need someone their their own chinese internal staff can't figure it out or it's too complicated or it takes them too much time to figure it out and then they reach out for for help and, and consultancy around that to to make that happen basically uh, agreed and i think the different levels of complexity i like to kind of break it i'm honestly not as up to date getting used to being down here in thailand but uh i think there's when i remember there was two levels there's like the more basic level, which is more like a static website, maybe not static, but like a company website where you're just displaying your company information that's relevant to your company license. And I Correct. think the second, at least when I remember, is the more complex level, which is where it's like user-generated content or where there's even comments on your blog account, I think, or, uh, you know, of course, any kind of forum, social media styles, like users can post freely. And that's much more sensitive and complicated because as you can imagine, you and not anybody, you know, users can say stuff that might not want to be said in China. So that one's, I almost think impossible, as far as I remember, was almost impossible for a foreigner to get, most likely. Um, usually, usually it's easier for a foreigner to get the first level, which is kind of just saying, hey, let me host a website that just shows my products or services and lets people like contact me for more information, if I remember right. Yeah, correct. I'll, I'll, I'll break down the list. So um, the first level uh, that you've just been talking about is called an ICP Bayan, um, or, or in English they call it sometimes ICP filing or, or it has other synonyms, but that's the basic level. Um, every website needs that. Um, combined with that, um, and actually the ICP Bayan is relatively easy to get, and then easy is definitely relative. Uh, but compared to the other, but compared to the other licenses, this is the easier one. Um, uh, but since uh, around February, March this year, now it's also the requirement to get a PSB license combined with your ICP Bayan, uh, which is goes through the um, police station department, PSB, whatever government department is exactly is. Um, every uh, province, every city has a different um, department in charge for that. Uh, but it's basically uh, related to police security and um, cybersecurity. So the ICP Bayan is just, okay, you're allowed to host a website and then the PSB is about the security of the online internet. Mm. And those, those are become mandatory both now. Um, for example, the tier one cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, it's mandatory. Um, tier two and lower, lower um, provinces, it's being rolled out, but it's not fully been implemented yet. So in Chengdu, where I am based, it'd be expected to be later this year or early next year to be mandatory. So it really depends a little bit where your business is located. Mm. Um, but this is coming all over China. Um, and this is what I see a lot of companies not being aware of yet, of that PSB license. Um, and companies that have got an ICP Bayon license in the past now retroactively need to get a PSB license as well. So this is going to be a big thing um, and for a lot of foreign businesses that they're unaware of. And that's going to be an interesting how that's going to play out. Yeah. So from my experience, I, I, I don't think it's active anymore, but I, I had gotten one back in my days uh, at the basic level one. And I, I can look it up for you if you, if you give me the domain name. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, yeah, this is all like public information. Not like your whole application is not public, but uh, there's just databases with all the ICP licenses that have been given out. Um, wow. Same for for like the PSB license and some of these others. They're just uh, like com company registration in Hong Kong. You can look up my company name and find out a certain set of yeah, information, not everything. Um, and the same goes for for these licenses in China. Interesting. Uh Shadstone.cn, at least I think, or dot com. Oh, but, uh, I'll look it up after the show yeah, for you. No uh, 
but basically I remember I had to take a photo. I remember it was like this, it's obviously cloudy. Yeah. It was like 10 years ago, but I remember having to go to like a licensed photo area. Like they had to have a license, they had to be approved by the IC, what the government mm -hmm. to take it. And then that your ID and photo is connected to the license, right? So what that means is, in my meaning, is that person, <laughs> I was liable for the content on this website is kind of how I interpreted that, right? Like by me. Yeah, for sure. This is the whole reason why they do these processes. So for an ICP Bayon right now, you need um, the legal representative. So yeah. the company yeah. owner, basically, or the, the legal representative of the, of the company. And you need a webmaster role. They can be the same, uh, but preferably it's a different one because the webmaster has to be a Chinese person. Um, Got it. And, and the webmaster is responsible uh, together with the... Um, legal representative for, for the content that you put online. If you start talking about things you shouldn't be talking about in China, then uh, you can be damn sure if they find out and, and they will find out real quick that, uh, that you will have some friendly police officers at your front door uh -huh. um, because all that information where you live and where your company is registered is also all part of the application process. I can remember another site... Um it was there was like all these Twitter clones coming out before, while Weibo was still brand new. You know, I think there was even still so many Weibo clones or Twitter clones. And this one was a Shenzhen-based company. I won't say the name, but I knew I met. You know, I did all these startup weekends and everything, and I met the guy, this one of the co-founders, and uh, they got shut down while I knew him. So it didn't get blocked. You get you know, like Twitter just gets blocked, but if you don't follow this stuff, you get shut down. So he says he was a CTO co-founder. And they uh, hopefully <laughs> uh, they basically visited his uh, company in the middle of the night. He says on a, on a weekday and uh, pulled the plug. He said like totally took them offline. They had servers in the office and they just came there and took them offline because they said they didn't follow strict enough. Because that was like a user generated license, right? So that's a much more sensitive one where there's users. So they just so the one we the, the one we just talked about is like the basic level. If I go back to I said I would make a list. So we have the basic level with an ICP, Bayan, and a and a PSB. Then you have a, a network and culture license. That's like sort of a, a translation that we use for for the user generated content license, basically. So anything that touches on on culture or user generated content that needs a license and that is super hard to get. Yeah. Um, then you need a commercial ICP license if you want to do digital payments. So if you want to get paid online, uh, and that one is also very hard and very expensive to get. And according to uh, the regulations, foreign companies should be able to apply for it. But I have no known cases that a foreign company has successfully applied and gotten that license approved. And then if you want to be like a, a Taobao kind of thing, like a marketplace where you're hosting other people's content or, or shops or, or products, you need an EDI or an electronic data in exchange license. And these are just the most five common ones. And then there's like a whole set of other ones that are like even more vague and some need pre-approval from other departments. If it's, for example, about education, then you need another license again. So it, it's really not easy yeah i think it really just boils down to do they trust you're gonna do what they want you to do and not let any bad stuff get put on there i, mean, I think that's the summary in my in my opinion is you know and then uh as far as your comments against a reason why maybe foreigners don't get a certain license i kind of blame or let's say google like you know they they had gotten uh, definitely a certain amount of these licenses and promised the government they would comply so I think it just shows the Chinese government foreigners don't listen to or follow or understand or ultimately will do what they're promising to do, right? I, I think it's kind of like... Yeah, maybe. Um, in, in a lot of cases, a lot of things is possible, um, but it, it's just... And then we're touching maybe on a little different point of, of China. Getting things done here is a, is a different approach. Um, so even for Chinese businesses to get certain things done, you need to wine and dine and, and do more mm. things to, to get things done. Yeah. And, and foreign businesses are not able to build the same guanxi or those relationships yeah. or they're not willing to go through that length um, uh, from a morality or, or 
more practical standpoint. Okay. So it really, yeah, depends as well. Yeah. Yeah. So although I did say my wife agree with me, she's Chinese and I say like, it takes a long time to build this, you know, guanxi. Uh, but once you do have it, you know, I mean, it's hard to, not hard to lose, but it's where in the West they trust easily and give almost everybody like permissions and abilities to do certain things. But if you break the rule, you lose it that trust rather quickly but i feel like in china sometimes it takes a lot of time to build up the trust and then you know you you once you have it it, it does stay there quite a, a long time hopefully is the whole yeah I, I i agree with you um building up that relationship takes a lot of time and effort um but then you basically have it for life as long as you keep maintaining it yep so going through my list i guess um we can talk about some fun stuff or case studies, but maybe my last one is what are the, I guess we kind of touched about it, but what's the risks of hosting in China? Um, I would say the risks uh, hosting outside of China um, to, to reverse the question, basically. Sure. Um, people are like, oh, I'm afraid my site is going to get blocked. Yeah, if you're a CNN, you, you have a risk of your site getting blocked. But if you're just business X, they don't really care what you're doing. So... Getting blocked is actually quite uncommon as long as you don't have any specific content that they don't like. Um, just, again, which I touched upon in the, in the beginning, if your website is not optimized for how the Chinese internet work, because here just the services are different, like YouTube and Twitter, um, but also technically um, you can do a few things to make your site just load very slowly in, in China. Um, then you're just shooting yourself in the foot. So if you're aware of those things, you can have a website outside of China that is relatively okay. But with the great firewall, um, your website is always going to be slower than hosting in China. So if you really want to engage with Chinese consumers and they are probably the most depending, uh, uh, demanding, not depending, sorry, uh, demanding and most expecting consumer group around the world, you have to be in China. Like if your site takes longer than two seconds or if your app takes longer than two seconds to load, then you've already lost all your customers basically. If you don't respond to a customer service request within five minutes, you're not making the sales deal. So they're really demanding here. And for that, you need to put your digital infrastructure in China if you really want to engage with those Chinese consumers. Um. Well, I have the ability to ask, <laughs> why, why do a lot of, like, sometimes, like, I'm even going to baidu.com. It's not redirecting to secure. It's like, I think you can manually type it in, but a lot of times these sites are, I noticed that there's not as much HTTPS or SSL in China as overseas. In my limited, what I've seen, I don't know if you have an opinion or I've noticed that or agree with that, but. No, I, I, I've, I've seen it and it's definitely a frustration or a pet peeve of mine as well. And yeah, right. <laughs> I, like, I don't have the definitive answer to that question, but I have two reasons why. Um, they came from a less secure standpoint or like less pressure on security in, in the past. That has definitely been changing, uh, changing around China and the Chinese government is putting a lot more emphasis on that as well. Um, and then the other standpoint is SSL certificate. So it's like a technical thing. You need to buy a certificate to secure your, your domain name are actually quite expensive in China. Mm. So it's like a, a cost kind of thing. And therefore, a lot of companies decide, hey, no one really cares. Why do I spend the money if no one really cares? It's not that important. And the combination of that um, has led to, to that situation. But I, I'm seeing it changing. And I think within a year, max two, that's going to be, um, everything is going to be secure as well. It's got to yeah. be because it's, it's ridiculous right now how certain services, like important government services are yeah. running on unsecured Agreed. Windows 98 computers and then an unsecured website. Um, it's, 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 from a security standpoint, it's ludicrous. Yeah. And my second funny fact that just popped in my mind is we have to get a, a VPN into China because I'm in Thailand to get into online banking in China. I have to have, it won't work if I'm in Thailand. It just, uh -huh. 
like uh, my wife Wendy helps me, of course, but she just literally won't load. Like it doesn't let you log in. But I I had to teach her how to use a VPN to get a Chinese IP to then log in, and it worked. It's crazy. Yeah, that, that is the whole uh, new divide in the world, not just physically, but also uh, digitally. That's and there, There's two different internets, in my opinion. Yeah, um, I agree. So, yeah, this has been fascinating. John, thanks so much for sharing. And, uh, of course, people should talk about China Business Cast. I don't know if you want to share. Actually, you got the uh, the show an official account, I remember, at people, yeah, WeChat account and... Um, and then, of course, you have your your consulting business where you help people get hosted in China and all these different things we've been talking about. So uh, I don't know if you want to share a little bit about. Yeah. So for I like I've known you for quite a few years now. Yeah. I've been work, working together on a few things, but we, we started talking. I think it was January, mid January, roughly. Um, because you were hosting the China Business Cast before that, and yeah. uh, we, were, we were talking, and, and basically I took over around early February, um, around there, and um, I started releasing the my content for the China Business Cast um, from uh, the first of March of this year. So that's been definitely been an, uh, an adventure. Um, a lot of things has happened on the China Business Cast. We put about. I just counted before the show. We put out oh. 14 episodes. Nice. Um, or 13 and one is being published later this week. Um, I've already got about eight recorded for the future. So with a two-week schedule, we're, we're, we're looking pretty good for the next few months. Uh, we added a few guest hosts, which has like, really been exciting. Um, so we can hopefully start producing more content than just one, uh, one person. Um, build a, a WeChat official account because um, that's just my thing. Like that's where I do a lot of my work in. So that's not too much of an issue for, for me to build that. Uh, we build a WeChat mini program so you can listen on the, um, to our podcast on, on WeChat uh, directly, which is very cool. Um, one thing that was less cool is we, we got blocked um, while we're on this topic. We got blocked oh. on, on iTunes or Apple Podcasts yeah, you mentioned um, in, in, in China. So we're still everywhere around the world, but in China, you, I can't access it. And, and Yeah, because I, yeah, I said I could find it. I'm here in Thailand. I found it. But it depends where, you're, where your region for your App Store account is set. So if you're set to the US or Thailand or whatever, it's no biggie. But if, if you have a Chinese iTunes account or Apple account, then it uh, uh, doesn't load. Crazy. So I don't know why I like I emailed Apple. They never replied back to me. So good work, Apple. Um, but yeah, probably talking about something that was a bit too sensitive, but we're, we're still available on WeChat. So that's, that's, uh, that's good. Great. <laughs> Uh, maybe it's the name. Remember, you said like it's CBC podcast in the. Uh, oh yeah, I don't know. So we, if you want to be on WeChat, uh, certain names in in titles or in official accounts are not possible, or they don't allow that. So China, like just using the word China in your um, in your name is not allowed. So we couldn't use China Business Cast because the, the, we're, that's what we're called, but. That was not allowed. So then it would just be business cast, but that, that would not make sense. So we had to go with CBC podcasts. And, and, and there's all kinds of things like that happening in China where, uh, for other projects as well, where we have to be um, mindful of, of what we can do and what we cannot do. And uh, anything that is related to China, the, the name, the flag, uh, Chinese looking stars that are used, symbols, uh, world maps, those are all off limits and uh, some things that you should work around. Yep. Well, uh, this has been great. So where's, where can people find you, all your different things online, your rebranding on your, your business stuff? Yeah, so um, like the easiest way is to reach out on my LinkedIn, I guess, uh, to start. Yeah, you've been really, um, so, yeah, you've been really putting some amazing content on your LinkedIn. Yeah, with with the company, uh, we've been building a, a weekly China digital update. Um, so we cover basically everything digital or marketing or what's hot in, in China for every week. 
Um, so we've been pushing that out. That's available on LinkedIn. That's available on our um, uh, other WeChat official accounts. Okay. And then the company website, um, I guess, uh, redstarconsulting.com, which is going to be rebranded, but we'll, we'll auto-redirect it after when that's done. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's not going to be a problem as well. Uh, I guess those are good ways to to find out more about me. And of course, the, the podcast, chinabusinesscast.com and um, on WeChat, if you just search CVC podcasting, then you'll also uh, find us pop up. Great. Yeah, we'll link it up in the notes as always. And it's been a pleasure to have you on, Johns. And yeah, let's uh, let's keep on helping with the content creation and the community building in China and other parts of Asia. Well, you're the original China China content hustler, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to to set a it's continue a grind, your example. Right? It's it's a grind, man. It's just content creation is a lot of work, but it's it is a, it is a lot of work. But uh, thank God I, I have a team to help with that. So. Um, it's awesome. So, sometimes people think, oh, you put out so much content. Yeah, yeah, I, I know I do, but <laughs> it's not always, always everything is me. Yeah. Okay. Thanks again. Okay. Thanks a lot, Mike. Have a good one. Are you looking for banking options in Hong Kong? We all are, aren't we? Neat8.hk is a GFA partner. That means they are a sponsor, a supporter of our content and what we do here. They've been pioneering in the online banking space in Hong Kong and fintech. And over the years, they have been growing quite a bit. Uh, we've been collecting all the feedback we can and working closely with Neat.hk to improve and grow their services to help business owners like you listening with their business. If you're interested in checking them out, www.neat.hk, where they can help you with virtual banking. Technically, I think they can say not bank, uh, but of course, financial solutions, and they also just released a USD account. They'll also be coming to the Cross Border Summit, and we appreciate their support. Tell them GFA sent you. All right, thank you, Johns, for sharing. Glad we finally got you on the show. I'm really happy we made a nice deal for China Business Cast. As content creators, it's a ton of work, and I wanted to focus on one show. And I know a lot of people miss, missed me out there. I got some messages. Um, China Business Cast, I definitely recommend subscribing if you're not already. It's more domestic China business matters. Also, John's is finally, wow, we got a crying baby here. This is seriously, I think anybody known, airport life and anywhere in the world, but definitely in, in Asia or wherever. I'm all good though. But yeah, I mean, John's is doing amazing work there, and I'm so happy he's following through with an idea that we'd always talked about multiple hosts. He has guest hosts, guest speakers people on the ground in China, different parts of China, which is really, really amazing. And we are just um, so happy to just kind of build up this content and sharing knowledge and strategies with people that are interested to learn. You know, I just, I want to empower people. It's not about money, it's about the will to learn and live. I'm mentoring some e-commerce sellers as well, which is really rewarding. And it's just about taking action and it's not about money, right? You can't buy uh, of course, you can buy a company like Alpha Rock is doing, but you got to still execute. You got to keep applying and learning and adapting and growing. If you keep sit, sit back and expect things to happen, they're not going to happen. But yeah, I mean, these Chinese hosts scare me. You know, um, another one is WP2Static.com. My buddy Leon programmed this many years ago. It's a really popular plugin in in uh, in the WordPress space, it's WordPress to a static HTML. So I use that on my own Chinese blog. I have a Chinese blog at mylini.com, which is my Chinese name, M-A-I-L-I-N-I.com. And I don't host in China. I mean, I, I could if I had a server. I just, it's not even WordPress. I, I do it on a development server. I don't wanna get so geeky with you. And then I just spit out a HTML files and it uh, looks just like WordPress, but it's um, static. I actually really recommend it for Chinese hosting if you're interested. WP, the number two, static.com, or just search static websites in your WordPress plugin. It'll probably be one of those top ones. There's a couple others, but we're, uh, I'm helping out Leon also. And it's amazing the availability to convert your WordPress into static. It's faster, it's more secure, especially with Chinese hostings and uh, the requirements for servers there and getting database access and then protecting that and SSL. 
you know, you could put it in a Chinese server or a US server, but it's way easier. You can just email it to somebody, say here, just upload these files to the server. I should talk to Johns about this. Um, we recorded the show just a few days ago, but that's also another option. I know a lot of you actually Google for me just still on static, uh, still on WordPress. I want to get off. It's so scary. We've gotten attacked multiple times, seriously, multiple times. People want to crack because, yeah, we've been doing six years of consistent content and, our, you know, that builds up value in the website's, uh, you know, traffic. And these hackers want to crack into your website, pump in their spam. So uh, you just got to make sure you stay up to date. And it's, isn't it unbelievable there's not much SSLs in China? I mean, you can see it. Go to www.baidu.com and it will be not secure. Of course, if you manually type it in, it HTTPS, it will work. But for some reason, they're not forcing SSL. I, I, there may be some reason, I don't know. But as far as the recording today, I just tested it. It doesn't force you to do... Um, uh, it doesn't force you to mm, be HTTPS, which in the West seems like it's almost a requirement for uh, websites to be secure. But it is, um, it is amazing, and Chinese hosting is tricky, and it's liable, right? So I just want to know what you guys think of today's show, and your hosting, and being the water, right? And you want to be the brand. You, most likely, you're not going to need a website. We didn't say that too much in the show, but most people sell on you know, WeChat stores, Tmall, Taobao, Jingdong. You know, so many people says you don't need to put a website online to uh to do business in china people don't use websites right i mean it's kind of sad dude. actually all this stuff's sad wechat even facebook i mean heck even shopify is almost it's kind of your website but it's in their server and things like that and it's really global here so what i'm trying to say is being the water you know being the brand we've talked about so many times Actually, I was just invited to speak at a branding conference, which is pretty awesome, uh, in Singapore. I'll let you know about that later. But yeah, branding is, I think, the most important thing long term. You know, trademark and IP. We've had Tyan on the show last week, but uh, you know, he's still got to host content. You know, and to get into China, you, you probably would probably be best in WeChat, Jingdong, Taobao, Tmall, all that stuff. But I still recommend a website. Come on. Maybe don't do WordPress because it is scary and it's not so secure. Sometimes in, uh, I can't even read some of the cPanel stuff in China. My Chinese isn't so perfect that I can read high-tech Chinese uh, characters. So, you know, spitting out HTML, even just a static website. I still think people are searching on Baidu. People are... Uh, you know, trying to read your website, depending on your industry, I still think it's good to have a corporate website. Maybe you're driving it to the Taobao, to the WeChat. If you look on mylini.com, you go to contact, I do have a QR code and I tell you how to find my WeChat, but I still like to have a home base for, uh, for China. And, but I don't have a Chinese server right now. They're actually really expensive too. You know, we didn't talk about it in, in the interview, but Ali Yoon, which is by Alibaba, and they're uh, they're pretty pricey. I mean, there's others too. I think of they've emailed people have emailed me on the show, wanting some solutions, uh, or wanting me to promote their solutions for Chinese hosting. There are some ch- lower costs, more shared server ones, but I think it's just because it's so highly regulated there and the risks are so high for a hosting company, they just keep their costs higher, and uh, it really discourages people. Uh, another since we're in this blah 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 session is I bought a lot of websites off Chinese bloggers back in 2010-11 because the government put in these huge regulations for these licenses and they shut their servers down but they still have maybe their domains because it wasn't like GoDaddy or whatever but they didn't they kind of gave up on their blogs it was really sad and I was doing internet marketing at the time so I was picking up domains for like a couple hundred RMB and uh, I don't want to get into old school SEO strategies but you know there is value to, to content websites. So I was picking up these bloggers in China because they just were fed up and they didn't either know or want to figure out Western hosting solutions and they didn't want to or weren't able to get through the, the Chinese licensing requirements. And it's sad. It's some of them I, I look at now, they're like spam ads, you know, those pop-up park websites now. It's just all these blogs just died. I remember in 2010, 2011, I picked up some of them and... I don't think, sadly, I didn't keep them either. 
use them for a little while, but China is just not normal. I mean, so many people email me, Mike, how do I host my website in China? How do I host a website in China? How do I do Chinese SEO? Unfortunately, if it's not the, probably the best use of your time, more depending on, of course, the industry, but you're probably more better off focusing on uh, WeChat, social media, or Weibo, or Taobao, Tmall, and just paying ads and paying them, you know? That's, that's the way things are going. But I would say it's also important to at least have a, like a one pager, you know, maybe index.html homepage um, and find some kind of solutions or talk to Johns. Johns is awesome, you know, he's content creator like, like me here and China Business Cast host and supporter, and we are working together. And that's what this community is about helping each other. So I hope today's session helped you out. Um, people keep moving around me, it's kind of freaking me out. I keep looking to make sure my bags are okay. I'm gonna get off this microphone. Uh, I got a little bit extra time in the airport. And uh, I'm working on the newsletter next. If you enjoy the podcast and want to get email, it's not really spam, I don't think. We try to make quality emails once a week, usually on Thursdays. I think we have the Getting Started email series, like seven or eight, and we try to pitch you something at the end, which not many people buy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's also the newsletter on Thursdays we send out. Um, we try to keep it interesting about, of course, what content we're doing here, things that are happening. I try to have some of my insights. So if you like that, you can go to globalfromasia.com slash subscribe and you can pop on over there. I think I'll give you a couple of options if you want the welcome series or just get on the newsletter. I try to work on my segmentation. It's so hard. Western hosting or, in, you know, Chinese hosting, hosting websites is not easy long term. You know, of course, you can pop up a website, but it's about maintaining it, updating it. I think all my email subscription buttons are working all over the website, but if it doesn't work, email still works. Mike at globalformation.com. Let me know what you think of the show. Let me know what you think of this blah, blah, blah session. And I've been also asking some questions in our newsletter and getting some, getting some replies. So I think that's it for now. We're right at the 10-minute mark, literally, uh, at least on my recording. Alvin, our amazing editor, will make this show beautiful. Probably cut out some of the BS that I stuck in here. So... Thank you again for listening, and I am working on the newsletter next. Take care. Bye-bye. To get more info about running an international business, please visit our website at www.globalfromasia.com. That's www.globalfromasia.com. Also, be sure to subscribe to our iTunes feed. Thanks for tuning in.